Really, the mistakes a lot of people tend to make as enthusiasts getting into the real estate market is generally they buy on gut feel and they buy on what their budget kind of allows them to look at. And really, they buy in areas they fundamentally uh, have been exposed to. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, code cracking stuff, folks. We're going to dig into what not to buy. Yes, does that sound riveting? Let's actually have a discussion around what type of properties are in the market today that you should avoid, that you should not participate in purchasing. The Australian market is huge. It's a $10 trillion marketplace. It's full of real estate, all types of real estate, from brand new properties to old properties to sleepy villages to primary cities of commerce. And of course, as a property investor, we all have different budgets. We have different starting points when it comes to becoming a property investor. So I think understanding what properties maybe are best to avoid as a property investor is an important conversation. So that is today's show. I hope that sounds riveting. I'm actually excited to talk about it. I've certainly made a lot of mistakes along the way when it comes to being a property investor. I think a big part of my job is just simply sharing information today about my experience as a property investor, where I've gone wrong as a property investor so other people can actually succeed in property at a much faster rate than certainly I went through. But hey, welcome back regulars. You know the show, play the program in double speed, get your life back. And of course, wow, if it's your first time tuning into the program, you have found and struck real estate podcast heaven. Yes, folks, there's a lot that goes on here at the Urban Property Investor. But uh, just a little tip, all of the episodes I've done are lessons on real estate. So feel free to go back in time and explore some past episodes. If uh, today's show, which is avoiding buying the wrong real estate, doesn't rock your boat, you're more than welcome to go and find some past episodes I've done and get some lessons on real estate. But hey, I hope everyone is well. I just got traffic fines. Yes, six traffic fines in a row. Uh, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know if you parked your car for six days in the one spot, you could actually get fined six times in a row. I don't even know if that's legal. It feels illegal to me. It feels like the government's, uh, you know, after me for um, for traffic offences, uh, which, which really was one traffic offence, but ultimately I've got six fines. So I don't know if anyone's a traffic lawyer, maybe DM me because uh, I'd love your opinion. Did I do one offense or did I actually do six offenses? It's a big, big question. But hey, I'm just glad my car's not being towed away and uh, I'm here today to talk real estate. And as I was sort of alluding to, I guess for me, I've, I've, invested in real estate for a long time now. I mean, a big part of my journey began, you know, in my mid twenties, um, getting out and finding inexpensive properties to buy. And of course, uh, I made a lot of mistakes in my early years, sort of choosing the wrong properties, properties which were full of maintenance costs, capital improvement costs, properties which weren't going to mirror up with my time horizon Properties which, as they continued to age, would continue to cause me problems. I've faced all sorts of dramas when it comes to real estate investment from uh, really the, the buying at a peak of a cycle to picking up an asset which has uh, absolute problems with its peers, real estate with problems with its roofing, electrical issues, plumbing issues, you name it, 
I've uh, I've certainly acquired some lemons over the years, and uh, really, I think the powerful lesson in making mistakes is you you learn, and if you have the ability to to go again, you start to work out how to get things right now. The thing with when I got a lot of my real estate wrong, real estate was really quite inexpensive. I mean, some of the properties I bought were $75,000. And of course, uh, you know, I put them back on the market for $74,000 and um, basically did not burn much cash. But today to buy a good investment grade property, it's not cheap like it was. So once again, the mistakes just are inflating on themselves. And really, we talk about inflation being an economic measurement, but inflation also is a compounding concept of mistakes just get bigger and bigger and bigger the more things cost. And right now to build a property portfolio, it's not a can of Coke. It's uh, it's a lot of money. And so a lot of people enter the real estate marketplace and spend hundreds of thousand dollars, if not millions on real estate without not knowing much at all about real estate. Uh, and really the mistakes a lot of people tend to make as enthusiasts getting into the real estate market is generally they buy on gut feel and they buy on what their budget kind of allows them to look at. And really, they buy in areas they fundamentally uh, have been exposed to. And of course, the problem with all of that is if you're not exposed to all of the marketplace, you may not realize where and what suburbs are performing at a rapid rate of uh, growth you may not be exposed to even the right type of real estate and the right sort of lifestyle areas. So you see it sort of every weekend. Uh, There's people going to open homes every weekend. Um, They uh, don't really know what questions to ask the real estate agent. They don't know what they're even looking at from a title uh, concept around the real estate. They just are emotionally driven off the back that they know they need to get into property, they know they need uh, somewhere to live, and they've got a budget, and so they circulate around real estate, which they feel comfortable with. But feeling comfortable about um, an area is not necessarily going to create an economic outcome. And of course, Uh, People buy on all sorts of logic when it comes to real estate. And a lot of that logic creates a challenge with what next for real estate. And obviously, the worst thing that can happen to a property investor is for a property investor to go negative equity. Now, it's hard enough as it is to make ends meet by going to work, let alone if you were to then go to work, exchange of a time for money, Uh, and go to work and then eventually use some of that money you're exchanging your time for that you save to then invest in real estate. And if that real estate was to turn out to be a poor investment choice and go negative in value, then obviously uh, you start to live in a space which is very, very negative. And of course, When it comes to really choosing the wrong real estate, people do this all day, every day. Uh, One in five people will make a loss in uh, real estate. Um, There are plenty of suburbs where you can find just a repeat level of loss-making sales. Um, suburbs which are completely oversupplied with real estate, suburbs which are undesirable when it comes to what people actually want from society. And, you know, ultimately there is a real challenge for a lot of people when it comes to property investment because 
Investors' budgets expose investors to low-growing properties that are effectively high risk. Now, when you think about it, if your budget was $1 million, $2 million, $3 million, if you were spending $3 million, you generally are seeing high-quality pieces of real estate which are effectively low risk. The consensus is already built into the pricing structure of those properties that society has already created an agreement around those properties that they are very, very sought after. Hence why they're two, three, four million dollars. But investors tend to spend sort of 400, 500, 600, 700 thousand dollars, 800 thousand dollars. And though it obviously sounds like a lot of money, in real estate terms, it's starting to not be a lot of money. And again, because of the pressures that society is creating with what it costs to uh, even have a home loan, becoming a property investor is getting harder. And it's a lot harder than when I was buying $75,000 properties because today... That $75,000 property is, uh, you know, a lot more. And again, the risk has just goes up and up and up. And again, if you're circulating and buying the wrong real estate, you can quickly get into a negative equity position. Of course, that's not what property investment should be about. Remember, one in five people in regional areas sell their real estate really quickly. It's volatile because they're not seeing um, the future of those marketplaces. And uh, interesting enough, one in seven people in capital cities will sell their property within three years. Now, three years is not a long time to hold real estate. People uh, cannot possibly make much money in a three-year period unless there's a period of absolute economic booms. So uh, measure over a long period of time, the one in seven people will sell their real estate within three years. And you have to ask yourself the question, you know, what is wrong with that real estate as to why someone needs to sell it or what is wrong with that person as to what's happened in their life, as to why they need to sell it. Now, most of the time, it's probably what's happening in someone's life. You know, things like divorce and um, change of, uh, you know, living circumstances. But a lot of real estate is the wrong real estate. A lot of real estate investors buy is the wrong property and will create a negative equity effect. So I have 15 types of property which I avoid like the plague and I want to go through them with you. The first one is the environmental hazard. Now, as we know, climate change is ultimately unfolding. Uh, we've got places like Lismore losing a large percentage of their real estate stock to flooding the federal government right now is buying back large proportions of that city. Um, so the environmental hazards are absolutely real. And of course, if you buy real estate, which is going to be in an environmental danger zone, you may just find you are buying a ticking time bomb. And of course, uh, what, is happening today is a large proportion of housing is now not insurable. Uh, there's too many cyclones, there's too many floods, there's too many um, periods of natural change which are affecting housing. And of course, by buying that real estate, the growth rate on that real estate will be subdued because most of the market, if they do their research, does not want an environmental hazard in their life, a flood-prone property, a bushfire-prone property, a cyclone-prone property. And of course, this can rule out a large proportion of Australian real estate. I mean, ultimately, a large proportion of the tropics is 
affected by cyclones. And of course, that means it would be a risky play and a low capital growth play to buy in many areas in the northern precincts of Australia. So investors, obviously, are out to make money. And again, buying the right properties is as much about not buying the wrong properties. So the first one, the environmental hazard. The second one that I see a lot of, because I spend a lot of my time in new construction, is the market lemon. Now, I've spoken about market lemon theory a lot on this podcast. I'll just make mention of it again. Market lemon theory is the theory that the market does not understand the difference between a high quality property and a low quality property, uh, particularly in new construction. So a lot of people will buy low quality properties, not understanding what they should look for to find a high quality property. And so what happens is builders and developers flood the market with low quality properties because people don't know the difference. And of course, when you see the difference between a high quality property and a low quality property, you start to really appreciate the difference in the two. And of course, low quality properties have low levels of demand. And again, uh, for me, a market lemon is a really new build of low quality. It's, uh, it's something you should avoid like the plague. It's not going to create capital growth and uh, it's going to potentially even go negative on you or create a negative equity effect. So don't do it. Uh, are there beautiful new builds you can buy that are design-led? Yes, they make a lot of money. New builds are about community. Old established properties are about character. When a new build has no community and it's just an ugly new build, it starts to struggle. When new build has community, it does very, very well. When older properties form character, they do very well. So I often say there's no right or wrong in real estate. There's just the reality of real estate. And uh, both new builds and secondhand properties can make you money. But certainly in both new builds and secondhand properties, there's properties that are simply the wrong property to buy. The next one, which I would avoid like the plague, is a homogenous designed properties. Homogenous designed properties are just properties which are effectively uh, have no differentiators on the property. They don't stand out from the marketplace whatsoever. They don't have view lines. They don't have um, good land characteristics. They don't have, um, uh, you know, good levels of design and amenities. And you often see this in sort of circa, you know, 20-year-old apartment complex that, if you drive around your city, you will see them. Each apartment is the same floor plan, the same design. It, the building is bland. Uh, and ultimately, really, what you would be buying as a property investor is, 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 a, is it a design that is ultimately the same as design as the person next door to you. And so you're very affected by what your neighbors end up doing. A modulus homogenous design real estate is not world leading real estate and it really is the wrong property to buy. The next property I would not buy is the crime house. Yes, there are lower socioeconomic areas which have high levels of crime in our society. It's a fact. I'm not making that up. I'm not exaggerating that. I am here to tell you, you can get police reports done on streets, on suburbs, on neighborhoods. And you will find that in society, there are plenty of investor price properties in crime precincts. And again, uh, the high crime rate is a reflection of the low property prices. And again, for investors, because they want to spend four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000, today it is not a lot of money. 
And uh, what's left in the marketplace is quite often bad places to buy real estate, the crime house. Of course, if you end up victim buying the crime house, then uh, you're going to get the crime return, which is, um, you know, a meth lab in your house and no one paying rent. And today, which is even crazier, you not only would need to get a building inspection done, but today uh, even people who are buying these low-cost properties are getting meth inspections done to make sure that basically meth addicts won't come around looking for uh, a place to score drugs in those houses, which blows my mind. Today, you can get a meth report done. There are building inspectors and effectively meth inspectors. So I would not go near anything to do with that type of real estate. It might look cheap on realestate.com, but I can assure you it's one investor getting out of a nightmare, passing it on to the next investor. Uh, Speaking of nightmares, the renovation nightmare is also a type of property I would avoid like the plague. Now, renovating is a great way to add value to property. And in some respects, it's quite often fantasized a lot by property investors who think it's quite, um, you know, sexy to do. Uh, It makes a lot of sense. You buy a secondhand property, you dress it up and you make some equity. Whilst that is extremely possible and can be done, of course, for a lot of the real estate in the market, the maths does not work. Uh, You could easily buy an affordable property which needs a full refurb, a full gutting out and starting over 40, 50, 60 year old properties that need this work done to it. But once you do the maths of understanding the true cost of renovation and apply a feasibility to the home, you can end up in a place where the renovation can't actually happen because the end value would not actually uh, equal the cost of buying the property plus the cost of renovation, nor even get to a point of profit. So what happens is people buy a renovation property and don't renovate. And of course, what happens is the property stagnates because the market does not see value in the dwelling whatsoever. And so a lot of people end up with a low growing property that was bought with the good intent to renovate, but because the renovation can't happen, there is no growth on the property. And in some respects, it goes backwards. So again, the power of the wrong property don't do it. Just avoid those type of properties. If you're looking for a reno, uh, they're out there, but not every old property is a mathematical uh, sweet ride to property success via renovation. In fact, it's quite often the polar opposite. And of course, if the market adjusts while you're renovating, it can leave people well in the lurch where they've got an overcapitalized property which is overpriced effectively. The next property to avoid is the lender restriction property. Yes, lenders provide money to people. Uh, The ability for people to borrow money is an important concept of investment. And of course, uh, you want to buy real estate which is exposed to the most liquid amount of money in the marketplace. And of course, if you bought a property on a 90% LBVR, it would be great to know if the next person buying off you could also buy on a 90 or 95% LVR, uh, meaning that the market is open to that property. What happens to a lot of property investors, they might pick up, for example, a studio apartment. Um, It might look really inexpensive, might have a good rental return and they go to buy the property. They uh, even um, cross-securitize their family home to pick up the cheap little asset. They think they're buying it on a 90% LVR, but actually they're buying it on a 70% LVR. 
And that means for them to sell it, the wise marketplace who they would need to sell to may also only be able to borrow 70%, meaning they would need 30% to buy the property. And of course, that's a lot of money to come up with. And so the properties become illiquid. And so there's plenty of what I refer to as lender restricted properties. They've got challenges with them. And again, I would just avoid anything that has an LVR red flag to it. Maybe at the time you're purchasing, you can come up with some creative finance strategies to buy it, but most of the market can't. And so anything that the mass market can, cannot buy off you at an easy rate by going to their bank, you want to make sure you're not participating in purchasing that property. Right, the next property I've spoken about a few times on the pod. And uh, I did a show recently on good apartments versus bad apartments. And really, apartments have gone through eras here in Australia. Uh, if you go back to the beautiful architecturally design-led inspired period of Art Deco, great apartment complexes, really well built. Then you've kind of got two periods in Australia where you went through an homogenous mass production period. Um, the first homogenous mass production period of apartments was those 1960s red brick buildings. They created a bucket load of them. Um, they're all pretty similar to each other. Some have stood the test of time. 75% have not. And uh, particularly that 75% that have not, I would not be buying a red brick apartment uh, whatsoever. I think, um, you know, the idea of those apartments are well past their use by date. I think um, really the wrecking ball is starting to knock on the door. Um, I think it's just got a lot of future problems, particularly right now, they would be about 60 years old. Um, and thinking about carrying that into your retirement, say 20 years from now, an 80-year-old apartment, red brick, I don't see it. I don't see the value. I wouldn't do it. I think there's better real estate out there. So I would put that in the bucket of the wrong property. Please avoid. And of course, uh, if we look at some other apartments which have kind of market failed, it's those mass-produced 1990s to circa, you know, 2010 era apartments, which were mass produced and sold um, basically as small little properties. Um, and quite often that era was very much referenced as the population boom era of Australia, where you basically saw Australia bring in a lot of people from overseas a lot of people from different cultures and ultimately there was a lot of buildings produced really for overseas market entrance into the country which bought the real estate but the real estate has not been good capital growth real estate. We also have to recognize that that real estate really from the 1990s to mid 2010s there was less scrutiny around the building quality of those buildings. And really, if you date when government set new design guideline rules, I know, for example, in Melbourne, the des better designed apartment guidelines came in in 2017. So in Melbourne, I don't really look for real estate earlier than 2017 in that marketplace in apartments because... I can tell it's not going to work out. The building quality and the design standards were just too low. Unless you date it all the way back to the Art Deco era. So again, those buildings, are, you know, those classic, you know, you see them online all the time and just how cheap they are. You know, a two-bedroom apartment might be, $390,000 and it's, you know, built in the year 2005. Um, 
And uh, there are a dime a dozen on realestate.com and I would just avoid them like the plague. They are low growers and they've got building issues and you just don't need to participate in them. Speaking of building issues, I would also avoid the hazardous material home. Yes, today in Australia, there are bucket loads of houses with asbestos, bucket loads. Uh, I think some of the statistics were like one in three houses built in Australia were built with asbestos in them. Again, uh, I just look at the look of those homes and know, geez, I would not, one, want to be um, running a rental into those homes. They kind of give the slumlord vibe. Uh, And also just thinking of the health hazards that are connected to those properties that you could expose occupants to just doesn't rock my boat. I really don't want some sort of class action lawsuit put to marketplace that landlords are still renting out hazardous material homes to people. I I can see it coming. Uh, I can see some sort of smart lawyer, Aaron Brockovich, coming up with a concept that these homes should not exist today. Um, and of course, to renovate them, it's even more expensive because you're dealing with hazardous material waste, which... You got to get little men in white, you know, suits to come in and and deal with this problem. So again, on realestate.com, they can be very inexpensive and uh, come across like a renter's dream. But I would propose that they are absolutely the wrong property. Speaking of wrong properties, which today's show is all about wrong properties, isn't it? What about the evil CBD tower. Yes. How bad is the CBD tower? And of course, for property investors, you just don't want to buy the CBD tower, folks. Uh, Australians don't typically live in CBDs. There are streets in CBDs which would make good investments, but they are few and far between. Here in Sydney, you know, Harrington Street down near the rocks. It's 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 considered probably one of the only streets you would live in in the CBD. Um, Melbourne, Swan Street in the CBD. Absolutely stunning place to live. But the tower in the CBD, which is basically small little weird apartments does not make a good investment. And again, they are illiquid, they're hard to sell, they lose money, they might look good on paper from a rental proposition, but they're low growers and should be avoided like the plague. What else should be avoided like the plague is the cheap yet costly house. Yes, the cheap yet costly house. There are plenty of homes online today that are 30, 40, 50 years old, they look good, the land size is nice, but unless you're going to knock down the home, um, you're basically got a poor state of repaired dwelling. And I think for most property investors, the idea of growth is great. The idea of land to asset ratio is a proven form of capital growth. But ultimately, how much land should you have and how much asset should you have? If you've got 90% land and 10% asset, which is the house, the house is going to be pretty ordinary. And of course, the house is going to cost you money to run because that's where you get your rents from. And if your rent is constantly going to pay for maintenance and repairs, then you've got a real problem on your hands. And of course, I always say this, that Uh, You don't want to be in the business of taps and toilets as a landlord in real estate. It costs the same amount to fix a toilet in a $3 million house than a $300,000 house. So again, if you're getting rent on a $300 house and you're paying the same amount it costs to fix a toilet as to a $3 million house, your rent is going to disappear. Let's say you're getting a 5% return on a $300 house, which is $300 a week, and a repair is $600 a week. 
You've already lost two weeks rent for the year. If you do that seven times a year because there's multiple problems with the house, the doorknob falls off, the blinds need to be replaced, the, um, the electrics needs to be overhauled, you're not getting 52 weeks a year rent. And of course, the cheap and costly house is often the one which gets passed from investor to investor. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. And I often see even new buyers agents get into this racket, which is they team up with a selling agent who's the local area expert as the housing market sales specialist. Uh, they can't sell these homes to locals. So they ring a buyer's agent who does some sort of uh, sneaky, uh, this is an off-market transaction. And ultimately, they then tell their clients they've secured a property off-market. It's great. It's inexpensive. It's below the median. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars less than the house next door, which is a prime home, well-built, great structure. And what happens is people pay the buyer's agent, you know, $15,000, $20,000 to put together a deal, which is basically a property that would not even fetch the price that the buyer's agent has negotiated if the property went online and went to the marketplace and was actually market tested. It's, uh, it's out there. I see it all the time. Those homes are just a real back pocket thief. So uh, avoid them like the plague. They are definitely the wrong property. Remember, these are properties which are four, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars, which is that get started real estate investor mathematical number. Like I was saying before, the problem with the lower, the bottom end of the market is it's actually higher risk. Um, it's higher risk of what not to buy rather than what to put your foot on. And again, um, I'm not a fan of really the idea of almost like that removable house you often see in those country marketplaces. A lot of property investors will look in peri-urban areas or country towns or regional areas. And quite often you'll find the covenants to build a home on what was semi-rural land, which is now residential land, was a lot less. And you start to see ultimately what is referred to as transportable homes. They are basically homes which can be moved if needed at some point. And I think those removable dongers just, they just look horrible. And again, they might get a good rent in a regional community, but I just don't think that they are aspirational homes whereby someone goes, wow, I want to wake up and live in that removable donger house on that strange block of land. Like what family in Australia is going, that's their great Australian dream. I don't see it. I wouldn't buy it. Don't like it. I think it's going to create negative equity and you spin your wheels when it comes to a, being a property investor. Now, what else would I avoid as a property investor? I would avoid the overseas den. Yes. Uh, as we know, we went through eras here in Australia where overseas investors basically bought entire buildings. And overseas investors obviously don't really know the market that well. They're not in tune with what locals actually want. So for 20 years here in Australia, overseas investors were used to provide supply to lower rents. And uh, ultimately of late, they've been taxed a lot. So they've been sort of chased away by a stamp duty. But uh, what has been left is buildings which are 10, 20, 30 years old, whereby not one owner occupier lives in the complex to help guard and manage the strata scheme. And every owner is based overseas for the most part. And the buildings are just going down and down and downhill and just look terrible. And again, I would avoid those buildings like the plague. The other thing I would uh, continue to be vigilant on is a heat leaker. 
Yes. What's a heat leaker? Well, Australia has signed up to 2050 Paris climate uh, conditions. And we are going net zero, folks. And really what that means is government is going to at some point pull the trigger on making sure properties are thermally efficient. Now, in Canberra today, when you sell a property, you have to disclose its energy efficiency rating, its thermal efficiency rating. The ACT is the only territory in Australia where you today need to disclose that to the inbound buyer. The seller needs to tell the buyer, this is the thermal rating of my house. And of course, um, that at this present time is not such a big drama because if someone just wants a low energy rated house, they can buy a low energy rated house. But what if there was an introduction to a carbon tax on a low energy rated house, i.e. I have a seven star energy rating home, you have a one star energy rating home, why uh, am I um, paying the same rates as you? you? Your home causes more climate change than my home, um, you effectively should pay more rates than me. And so the concept is evolving, it's fluid. And I know in the Great Britain, um, they almost came very close to creating um, some heat seeker rules around what properties would be taxed over there. Um, here in Australia, to build a new home, you need to apply a seven-star energy rated uh, level of thermal efficiency to the home. Um, and so I would suggest anyone buying second-hand properties to, to look for a minimum of five-star. Um, and again, that means when you're doing your due diligence, if you're buying a property, you want to probably get a thermal report done on the property um, and why would I suggest that? I just can see down the track that there will be future retrofitting costs on certain properties in society or a carbon tax. And again, it's a little bit tin foil hat stuff that um, I'm just looking over the horizon and I can see it coming. What else would I avoid as a property investor? Well, certainly the C-grade investment. Remember, real estate is broken into sort of A-grade properties, B-grade properties, C-grade properties. Um, and you can probably go down to D-grade properties. Those C uh, and D-grade properties, you know, it can be like homes built underneath a power line. Like literally next door to you is a giant uh, power line that looks like, you know, looks like, some sort of like cancer cluster kind of vibe. So anything which is connected to like those, those um, you know, big, big, big power grids, I would just be avoiding like the plague. And, and certainly there's plenty of homes which are affordable online today. And then when you use some mapping, you're going, wow, okay, I can see why it's only $580,000 for a four-bedroom home. Uh, 200 metres from the four-bedroom home, using mapping, there's a giant power grid. Uh, it's not on realestate.com. It's not on the photographs on realestate.com. It's just it's, uh, it's, it's just up to you, the buyer, to do that due diligence. All right, what else would I avoid as a property investor? Geez, there's a lot to avoid, isn't there? Well, I'd certainly avoid those 1960s rabbit warren houses. You often see them with the cladding around them, um, you know, weatherboard kind of vibe looking houses. Uh, they're pretty small internally, like 115 square meters. They're typically three bedroom, one bath. Um, you know, again, I just do not see the appeal and why they would inspire people to pay a million dollars for more for them uh, 15 years for now. Like if anything, people are going to pay less because they're just buying a problem and need to put a wrecking ball through the home. So I wouldn't be doing it. Um, I think anything which has those rabbit warren 
floor plans from the early project home era to the late uh, weatherboard era. Like people don't live like that anymore. People don't have those segmented little rooms that uh, don't flow. People are very much open plan, want to see where their kids are. They want um, multiple living rooms. They want separated bedrooms. They want en suites to the master bedroom. Uh, they want study nooks. They don't want the rabbit warren. And uh, again, I, you know, it might look good price wise, but I would avoid it like the plague. The other thing I would avoid like the plague is the entry level level architect, uh, basically residence. And you see it all the time. These kind of pastel colors, lime green, um, strange red buildings that for whatever reason council approved, I think it's a shame. Um, I drive past them and I look at them as property pollution. They can be, you know, townhouses or, or apartments which are just like, what happened here? Why did the architect choose, uh, you know, bright orange or lime green to, to as a facade? Um, you know, like, I think it's appalling, to be honest with you, that we live in Australia, which is a beautiful, natural, um, very, 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 uh, you know, I guess, natural colored place. You've got your blues of the ocean, the greens of the bush, the browns of uh, the gum trees, the whites of um, of also the gum trees, the eucalyptus trees and so forth. And then you drive through the city and you see these freaking ghastly, uh, you know, pastel colored building that some architect who shouldn't be an architect has designed and really, to me, it's just pollution. And I think sometimes people look at those buildings and go, holy cow, you know, how, like, no wonder people do not like investing in apartments when most of the apartments, 90% of the apartments out in society are just architectural failures. And again, don't invest in the architectural failure. Absolutely some great apartments designed that are architectural designs, not architectural failures. And really my final really building I would not consider is the late 1970s apartment complex. Uh, some of them are blonde, more of a blonde brick than a red brick. Not a lot of natural light, not a lot of great windows. Again, 50 years old today, past its use by date. I think it's time to... Uh, Make sure you don't choose that as an investment. Now, remember, guys, like the dwelling pays a big part in your property investment success. And when you think about how property investment works, it's broken down into three parts, right? You've got your purchasing part, which is called acquisitions. You've got your consolidation part, which is reducing debt. And you've got your lifestyle part, which is basically living debt-free off the income producing investment from the real estate you bought. Now, if you choose a high quality asset uh, being a good dwelling, you'll get the generation of income. The generation of income equals the generation of time. The generation of time equals the generation of growth. The generation of growth equals the generation of wealth. and allows you to go, well, what I bought I do not now need to spend extra cost propping up the asset. So instead of putting money into the asset on repairs and maintenance and knockdowns and new roofs and, um, and or not having money um, that is creating equity for you, um, instead of dealing with all that, you just go into debt reduction because you've ticked off, you've got a really good property. So you start reducing debt, you start going from, oh, I bought a property, now I'm going to pay off the property. Now I'm going to live off the property. And the simpler and cleaner your asset is, the quicker you can go from acquisition consolidation to lifestyle. If you've got a low quality asset that basically is very stagnant, doesn't grow, doesn't do much at all, just costs you more money every week to own, the low quality asset really ends up 
putting you in a place where there's a continued spend on maintenance and therefore a continued need for capital improvements, i.e. large-scale renovations. If you don't apply those large-scale renovations, because there's a continued need for maintenance, you start to get low-income tenants. And instead of the generation of wealth, you get the stagnation of wealth because you've got the generation of costs happening rather than the reduction of debt. And so you get stuck in a period where your real estate spins its wheels, becomes stagnant. You never leave acquisition, i.e. buying the right property to reduce debt to eventually get to lifestyle. So you get stuck. And uh, really, that's not what you should want as a property investor. All right, folks, that's it for me. Uh, I'm off. Leave a review. I hope you enjoyed the show. Let's talk again soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.